This week on Maker Update, a dorm room drone show, a tiny volumetric display, a new look at screen printing, and bullying robots. Hello and welcome back to Maker Update, the show where we keep you in the know on all the cool things that makers are making. I'm Tyler Weingartner and I realize you've been seeing a whole lot of me lately. Don't worry, Donald will be back next week. In the meantime, we've got a great show for you, so let's get started with the project of the week. Drone swarms are becoming more and more of a thing, and they're a great alternative to celebration fireworks for folks who don't like all the loud booms. But so far, they've only been really viable outdoors. So far. Joshua Bird is trying to crack the code being able to get millimeter level tracking of drone swarms within his own dorm room. And he's making some really solid progress. Each drone in his system is a 3D printed 95 millimeter airframe with 8250 brushed motors, an ESP32 for connectivity, and an F3 EVO flight controller. In addition to the ESP32, each drone has three IR LEDs that will be used for tracking. To track them, he's buying up moribund PlayStation Eye cameras for cheap and modifying them to make sure they're sensitive to the IR spectrum and then putting them in a new enclosure with an infrared ring floodlight. While he is funded for this project, it's great to see that his approach is cheap, cheap, cheap. You can spin up a basic demo of this for around the same price as a dinner for two, but eventually you're going to want to scale it up. Keeping everything cheap makes it easy to do that. The other cool thing is seeing how even with only four cameras, the drone is able to keep its position while being blocked from camera views. It only needs two cameras to keep its position, and even if it loses that, it recovers pretty quickly. It does this by an array of several PID algorithms. If you've been keeping up with Sean Himmel's video series about PID systems, you know that they can be pretty finicky, which is why the drones still womble a bit before returning to their assigned position. It's still a work in progress, but this one looks like it has a lot of potential, especially for indoor arena performances. It's a cool project and all of it is open source, so if you're interested in pursuing it, check out the link in the description. More projects. If you've been following our news, you know that we're in love with these robots being prototyped by Disney, and we're not the only ones. They've also caught the attention of James Bruton, and unsurprisingly, he's working on building his own version. He's already got a few places to begin from, both his BD-1 bot from the Jedi Fallen Order games, but he's also digging deeper into his former build of the Gonk robot, one of my favorites. James is trying to simplify the design by eliminating the hip side pivot joint, and just making joints for the vertical pivots at the hip knee and ankle. As of this time, he's got a basic walking platform going, but there's still a ways to go. Regardless, it's fun to see James's take on this project and all of his explanations of robot mechanics. Through YouTube, I learned about this tiny volumetric display by Mitzella. Most volumetric displays involve 3D arrays of pixels. Sometimes they're LEDs and sometimes they're stacked transparent displays but Mitzella is taking a page out of the playbook of those spinning POV displays and adding an additional access to it. They've got a one-sided LED matrix that's mounted vertically on top of a CD-ROM drive motor, along with an IR sensor and even the coin cell battery powering it all. When the motor spins up and the display lights up, you can see multiple demos of volumetric displays, including a spinning cube, a dropping, sloshing liquid, and a roaring bonfire. And over on Hackaday, I learned about this portable Hackintosh by iCat SJ. This is powered by a Latte Panda Alpha, which is an x86 single board computer capable of running Mac OS Ventura. It has a 1080p LCD display and a tiny USB hub to connect the PCB keyboard, mouse cursor, and mouse buttons to interface with it. This project is shockingly simple, but it's pretty satisfying to see a full desktop OS running on a CyberDeck style handheld. Time for some tips and tools in case you haven't noticed, it's gift giving season. And Bob Claggett of I Like To Make Stuff has a list of tools 
that he's used in his shop over the past year, and it's worth checking out. From toolboxes to cutting mats and multi-tools, there's a lot of great, if somewhat basic, suggestions. One of my favorites here is championing the use of 12-foot tape measures. They're easier to carry than your 25-foot chonker. You don't need that length most of the time. Bob has a specific suggestion for a tape by Comalon that he loves because it's easy to read and has both imperial and metric on the same tape. I know that Kickstarters are always an iffy proposition and sometimes full of gimmicks, but I'll admit I'm pretty intrigued by this screen printing machine by Xtool. Instead of using photo resist on the emulsion, you can use a laser engraver to remove the emulsion, making it easy to take your digital design to print. The standardized frame also makes easy work of registering multiple screen printing frames, so multicolor printing is fairly easy. Screen printing has been around for a really long time now, so it's cool to see some fresh ideas here. And finally, in case you missed it, Cleo Abrams' visit to Boston Dynamics is definitely worth a watch. The highlight of the trip is, of course, meeting Atlas. But in doing so, she asks all kinds of interesting and illuminating questions like, why are legs so important? And why not a tail to push the form beyond the basic humanoid model? But as this video goes on, they introduce the concept of more of X paradox, and it goes like this. The things that look like amazing feats for the robot to do, like this backflip, are surprisingly easy. But the stuff we think of as simple, like a slow jog or sitting in a chair, is really tough for Atlas. It's a curious and fascinating look at what lies ahead in the field of robotics. For this week's DigiKey Spotlight, the bite-sized engineer is building a Wi-Fi connected weather station. Weather stations have been really popular holiday gifts recently, since data collection and citizen science is fun for a whole lot of folks. And because it's Wi-Fi connected, that means you can easily log the data as well as contribute to community climate projects. The weather station is made from the SparkFun weather meter kit that includes an anemometer, a weather vane, and a rain gauge. And an Adafruit temperature, pressure, and humidity sensor tracks all the other vital changes. A LiPo battery pack and a solar panel keeps everything powered, and Adafruit I.O. tracks all the data. Check out the video to follow along with the build, and maybe make your own. Alright, and that is going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed the show, let us know by giving us a thumbs up, leaving us a comment, and subscribing with the bell so you don't miss the next episode. As always, huge thanks to DigiKey for making this show possible and to you for watching. Take care. We'll see you soon.